I've learned from previous talks that this is the moment that you're paying attention best. So I'm using this moment at the start to acknowledge the students whose work I'm using as examples in this uh, talk. None of the designs are mine, they're all student work and their names will be at the bottom. So um, if you choose to applaud at the end, applaud for them, not for me. Um, about a third, 30% of all food that is grown in the world is not eaten. It goes lost or is wasted. Lost means that it's not coming off the field properly and wasted is somewhere along the chain. It is not eaten but thrown away. 30%. And, um, well, while that is a lot, um, if we are to feed an ever-growing population and if we want to keep the burdens of agriculture within reasonable bounds from an environmental perspective, then this problem seems like one to tackle. If we can reduce that 30% of food that is not eaten, then we would improve a lot. So 30% rough sketch of some food, 30% really is a lot of things that we don't eat. So what happens? Where, where do these uh, things get lost or wasted? Well, you can distinguish two parts between the farm on the one end and the fork on the other, um, where things can go wrong. One is on the supply chain side, so we're growing things on a farm, we're harvesting that, we're processing that, we're packaging that, we're transporting that. Uh, and we're retailing that, so we're, we're selling it to, to people. In that process, a lot uh, can go wrong. Um, and in my own work, I'm mainly interested in the, in the packaging part. And um, while a lot of the uh, attention in, in the wider media is often that packaging is a bad thing, and also in Sweden we have packaging-free supermarkets that uh, blame packaging for all the environmental trouble in the world. Uh, certainly also with ocean plastics, that's an uh, often discussed problem. My perspective is actually that we have too little packaging. There's too much food that is being wasted, uh, that doesn't get to consumers' homes, that doesn't get eaten uh, because we have too little uh, packaging. But that's my work, I'm going to talk about my students' work, and they have focused more on what happens after. Us, as consumers, at the later stage of um, this process or this trajectory from farm to fork, we throw away a lot. As private people in our homes, but also in restaurants or at TEDx events, there are 10 reps left outside your job to make sure that they don't get wasted. Um, but we do shopping, and I don't know how it is for you, but I have a family, two kids, so we do shopping once a week, so we have to plan for the whole week, and all kinds of things can go wrong at the shopping uh, end. For instance, just an example, um, expiry dates for meat in Sweden aren't that long. If you don't pay attention, you might be buying something that expires that weekend. And if you don't pay attention, then you find out on Wednesday that your meat is three days over the expiry date. Three days is a tricky thing with meat, so you might not want to eat it anymore. So shopping, buying what you need, planning a week ahead, storing, um, saving food in the way that is best for the food so that it doesn't spoil as quickly. And um, we used to know, or well, not well, we, our grandparents' generation used to know a lot about how to keep food and uh, that some things should be cool and dark, that some things should not be put together because they influence each other. Uh, for instance, the, the, the tip of bananas give off a chemical that influences the ripening. So if you put them with other fruits, they will ripen quicker. And that kind of knowledge we have lost, we don't know anymore, so we just push everything in the refrigerator, even things that shouldn't be in the refrigerator, and thereby uh, causing more spoilage uh, of the food. 
planning, cooking, we cook too much. Um, plating, as in putting food on a plate, we put too much on our plate and then don't finish. Perhaps not all of us, but my children certainly. Uh, you can never predict how much they will eat, so that's always a challenge. Um, finishing your plate, uh, but also saving what you cooked too much. Or So do you, do you keep it? And many people put it in a box, box goes into the fridge, and then still afterwards they don't come around to eating it. Um, so they throw it out uh, after all. A lot of different mechanisms in how food gets wasted in our personal lives. Um, we have habits that grow into how we deal with our food um, and ways that we could change that. And that's what was the challenge that I set to my students. The challenge was design out food waste. And they could pick any of these, um, any mechanism in which food waste happens and then try to come up with ideas to solve that. And it happened to be that they are all more on uh, that side. So that's where our examples are. Just as a quick idea of my own work, I have one slide on that. Um, this is uh, an example, it's also not mine, but I took from colleagues, Helene Willen Williams and Frederick Rickström from Karlstad University. Um, if you look at packaging, say, okay, more packaging that can solve food waste. The example of a pre-sliced loaf of bread. You can buy one whole bread in one plastic bag, or you can buy two halves in two separate plastic bags. And you say, oh, it's more packaging, so two halves must be worse. But if having two separate bags allows you to keep it fresher longer and therefore throw away less um, of the bread, there is a trade-off somewhere. You can actually relatively easily with methodologies that exist for assessing environmental impact, you can calculate where the trade-off is. And for the one loaf of bread, it is one-tenth of one slice of bread that needs to be saved to justify having the second bag. That sounds realistic that you would save that much on average. Um, the big challenge from a research perspective, but we won't go into that right now, is if you have that idea and you made the calculation to decide whether it will actually be that trade-off or not. So a tenth of one slice, okay, but for other food stuff it might be a bit more. And then the question is, will you actually do that? Because it's not easy to um, intervene in someone's family and then measure whether that will actually uh, yield sufficient um, improvement. But now, influencing our behavior, making our um, way of shopping, planning, cooking, more conscious about the food and throwing away less. The first example is from students from my previous job in Delft in the Netherlands. And it was also the project that triggered me to set the same challenge to my uh, students here now in, in Schöping. And they came up with a project in collaboration with a Dutch um, retail chain, um, Aholt. And they, um, there is this tendency in the Netherlands to give away goodies when you buy sufficient groceries. So there are the collectible stickers of the football teams, which was the traditional one that you could collect if you shopped enough. And they came up with a similar idea that if you, for every, say, uh, 100 kroner or 200 kroner you would spend, you would get a kitchen magnet that um, talks about a type of food. It would tell you how to properly store it and also some nutritional value. Um, and you could use that to do better planning on your fridge door. Uh, and it would be connected to an app that the retailer already has and that would have to be reprogrammed for this. Um, so you could do all kinds of handy things. You could say, okay, now I have some tomatoes and I have a piece of fish um, and some leek and that needs to be eaten because it's almost going bad. So I group them together on the fridge. I take my phone, I scan those magnets together and the app will give me a recipe for those ingredients, which would be very handy. You could also say, no, I'm going shopping, I need this, this, this. I scan the magnets and it immediately goes into a shopping list for my shopping and helps me uh, plan. So that was 
a way in which they could really help people be more conscious uh, and at the same time provide them with information. So what should go into the fridge, what shouldn't go into the fridge? Um, should you um, have certain positioning, certain light, etc., to make sure that you store things in such a way that you don't waste them? This is one of the examples from the students from Linköping, from the new international master to your master program um, that we have set up here. And, and we try to tackle societal challenges like, uh, like food waste. And uh, Hannah came up with the notion of a bring back back. So you would plan for your shopping and you would realize that you bought some things that you're not using and that you're also not going to use and that you could return to the store um, or to, to other people so that somebody else might eat it instead of you. Uh, and of course that triggers all kinds of questions of how that would work and whether a store could accept something that they had already sold coming back. But that was not the interesting part for this project. She so made one of those bags and then went into people's homes and asked them if, you, if this concept existed, what would you bring back? So people started opening their cabinets and then filling the bag and saying, well, I'm actually not using this, this could go to someone else. And there are some of the uh, pictures of what came out. With the most amazing thing that somebody wanted to return, chocolate. And that's not something any of us could understand, but apparently there are people that want to return chocolate to the uh, store. But it's really interesting as a social experiment to see what people would bring uh, back. This is a project by Lynn, and she wanted to make um, a chopping walk helping you save um, half a pepper or half an onion. So you would chop your vegetables on top and you could open the lid and put the spare parts of the, 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 the half an onion that you're not using in it and then put half of your chopping block in the fridge. And by organizing the shape in such a way that next time you would chop you would miss half your chopping block you would be reminded there are some half veggies in the fridge and I should go and check whether I could use them instead of taking a new uh, onion. This was Maker's project and now we're moving and you see on the left that we're in different stages of, of this process where consumers have and um, Maker was concerned with the, with the plating and the conscious eating of the right amounts. So she made this... Uh, set of dishes that are very uniquely shaped and they're all relatively small. So there's not one big plate that you can chunk all your food on. So you have to really think through, okay, I'm setting the table, which plates will I use for which uh, components and how do I make this look uh, pleasing so that people are far more conscious about how they serve their food and thereby make sure that they put the right amount of food on the table that they will uh, actually eat. This was a project by uh, Malin, and she was really concerned with, um, with working with children and getting them to eat their food. Um, and she came up with like a family game, and the carrot on the wall was the most visual component, but there was also uh, an app involved. Um, and you would get to push the button this is not a small kit, this is my colleague Stefan, who is also involved. Um, there were also pictures of small kits, but they weren't all mine. Most of them were, but some of them weren't all mine, so I didn't feel entitled to use that picture. Um, if you finish your plate, you get to press the button, and then they all start blinking, and one light is added. You can slowly collect the whole um, carrot. Uh, and when we were exhibiting these results uh, in Linköping, um, there were actually small kits that were constantly fighting on who would get to push the button. So in that sense, it really proved her concept that that would be engaging for children to, uh, to, to really motivate them to be allowed to push the button. So I'm not sure whether it would be sufficient to force my children to finish their plate, but I would be intrigued to try. Um, this final example that I want to share with you is from um, another Lin Shoping student from a different program, from the Design and Product Development program, who is in a, 
was participating in an international project with students from um, the Netherlands and Ireland. Um, and they were also concerned with this idea that people have food and they bring food for lunch and they don't eat everything and they might have a piece of fruit left and I'm, I'm not eating this today. What if I don't? It's so they made this public place where you could leave something for somebody else to pick up with an app on the table in the um, university canteen, I left an apple or etc. And if somebody chose to pick it up, you would get a message that somebody was enjoying the food that you um, chose not to uh, eat. Um, so all of these try to change our behavior, try to change our habits. And it depends a bit from a, from a, if you look at it from a research perspective, whether you um, see this more as psychological or uh, like as a design intervention and it's going to directly influence me or more from a sociology perspective in which you say, well, we have a practice of cooking, we have a practice of shopping, um, which is more difficult to 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 change, but it's um, these kind of interventions that can make you reflect on what you're doing and try to um, do better. So apart from picking up one of the wraps when you leave so that it don't go to waste, think through when you're shopping next weekend or when you're planning what to cook or when you're um, putting food on a plate, what your habits are and whether they actually connect to you or your family members wasting some food and whether you could take some of these ideas and try to do better. Thank you very much.